Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Gabriel Martin and it's a pleasure to have you with us again for another episode. In fact, it is the last episode for 2021, so a very warm welcome to you all. Now the Universe team would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. We pay our respects to the elders of the past, the present and the future and we acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. We also acknowledge and respect the wise elder within all of us and the collective wisdom of all those here this evening. For those of you who are joining for the first time, Open Your Eyes to the Universe is a series of contemporary talks, conversations, open-eyed meditations, and interviews with people who inspire and uplift others simply by sharing their wisdom, their insights, and their experiences. Last month, um, that's October, on Universe, we were in conversation with Sonia Olsen from Denmark, Valerian Bernard in France, and Carolyn Froud in Germany. These three women are daily meditation practitioners, and each of them has a deep commitment to protecting our environment globally and are active as environmental change agents. We were talking with them on guardianship of our environment exploring that connection between our consciousness, our thoughts and actions and the impact on our world. And in particular, the connection between my consciousness and what's happening with our global environment. Well, since that conversation in October, Sonia, Valerian and Carolyn have been participating in the COP26, that's the Convention of Parties in Glasgow. And if you'd like to look at, um, at the outcomes of COP and their involvement in that, then please visit our website, BK Environment website, and Jan will put that link in the, in the chat box for you. And she'll also place a link to the direct, um, a direct link to the summary of COP26 as well. So check the chat box for that. Well, here we are, it's November, and tonight we're with London-based Munda Patel, and our topic of conversation is spiritual journey. Manda will be exploring what it means to be on a spiritual journey and sharing some of the things she's learned, you know, navigating the ups and downs, the challenges, the easy flows and the successes. Manda is a yogini of 40 years and she was handpicked and personally trained from a very young age by the Brahma Kumari elder Daddy Jankaji. Manda has a rare talent for spiritual pragmatism, the translation of simple but ancient truths into everyday life. She's a gifted speaker on values and spiritual development and has a warm and engaging personality. And look, she began her spiritual studies in London in around about 1981, and she's traveled widely as an ambassador and teacher of the Brahma Kumari's spiritual philosophy and practice. For more than two decades and up until 2021, Manda was the director of the Brahma Kumari's Global Retreat Centre in Oxford, one of the international values-based personal development residential retreat centres run by the Brahma Kumaris. The retreat centre is one of the UK's most popular retreat venues, hosting numerous national and international seminars and training sessions. And each year, more than, say, 10,000 people from different professions and walks of life would come through its doors. Um, now, viewers, at this present moment, Manda is unexpectedly in New York, where the time is two o'clock in the morning. So I'm sure you can guess, because of the huge inconvenience of a 2 a.m. interview, we decided to pre-record our conversation. Um, this seemed like the best solution. This means we won't be able to ask Manda questions tonight from the chat box directly. But if you have something you'd like to ask her, then please place it in the chat box and we'll send it to her for an email response. And we'll get that to all our viewers before Christmas. So having introduced Manda, let's now switch over to our recorded conversation with Manda on spiritual journey. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I thought perhaps you could uh, begin by just um, our whole topic is around spiritual journey. And um, I know that you've had a journey that started when you were very young 
I wondered if you could just tell us your story. Yes. Um, yeah, my story is actually quite simple. It's not so dramatic because often when people come on a spiritual journey, there's some dramatic happenings that occur. But for me, it was just uh, very simple in the sense that I um, was uh, working and I had sort of come of age. And for an Indian girl, you know, when she's in her late teens and starts to get to early 20s, it's always the question, so when can we arrange a marriage for her? And when that start question started to come my way, I started to think a little bit about what do I really want to do with my life? Not that I had any great aspirations or anything like that, but I was, my mother was already on a spiritual journey. And I don't mean just that she was a devout Hindu or anything like that. She was that before, but then she actually came across the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris. And so she, in a sense, changed her direction from being a traditional Hindu to someone who practiced spirituality, specifically a way of life that's very different. And so I had become exposed to uh, meditation, uh, deeper spiritual understanding. And so when this question came up for me as to what did I want to do in my life, I somehow found myself taking a little bit of interest in what my mother was doing, but more from a, 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 a curiosity place. What I did want was that I wanted my life to be uh, meaningful. I wanted to be able to be of service somehow. So when my mother first started her meditation, she made us all, I'm the eldest in the family. So all of us, myself, my two sisters and my brother and my dad actually, she made us all do the meditation course. So someone used to come to our home on a Sunday afternoon and for seven or eight consecutive weeks, he gave us the Raja Yoga meditation course. And then in the beginning, I thought, you know what? I don't think this is for me. I have a life ahead of me. I want to travel. I want to do this. I want to do that. This is what was in my mind when I was 19, when I did the meditation course. Then by the time I was 21, I was just questioning, what do I really want? And it did may seem to make sense what I had heard um, two years before that, um, your life has to be meaningful, that our world is in need of help and support, and that um, we have to be able to support each other. This is something that stayed with me very strongly. So when I started to think a little bit about it for my own self, I said to my mother, okay, I'll come to your meditation tomorrow. She was a little bit shocked, I think, because in the beginning, I was quite critical about her choice of doing this. Um, and so she said, fine. So I went to the meditation center early in the morning. And it was the first time that I was going there early in the morning. And I had this incredible experience of a deep sense of joy. It's, it's just something that oh. I remember very strongly. It was mm. just a deep feeling of joy and in that moment up until that point I thought I had everything I'm young I have you know ambition and I want to explore I thought I had everything but when that experience happened I knew that that was a key and so that's when I started to take a little bit more of an interest not necessarily seriously but a little bit more of an interest um, in the meditation and, and the practice that my mother was doing. So really that was the first thing. And then I carried on for a few months. And then I went to Mount Abu at the headquarters of the Brahma Kumaris, which is where I had the most profound experience. An experience of in a sense meeting myself, my true self, my spiritual self. Also an experience of meeting others on the spiritual journey where I felt I, I knew all these people. I knew the people, I knew the place and that these were my people and I wanted a life like theirs, a life of spirituality, life of 
an exploration, a deep internal exploration. So really that's very briefly my beginning. And it was in India when I learned that, that I realized that this is it. This is what I want. And I was very young, I suppose, 21 to make that huge choice. Um, it was not a small thing, I suppose. And um, I have to say 40 years later, having made that choice, there's been lots of highs and lots of lows and lots of amazing experiences and um, lots of challenges, if you like. But I have to say, I don't regret making the choice of being on a spiritual journey. I don't regret it at all. But at what point did you kind of know that, yes, I'm on a spiritual journey, that this is what it's about? Um, I think it's different for everybody. I don't think it's the same for everyone. People come to a spiritual um, uh, path in different ways. And often the belief seems to be that it's only when you're in um, in turmoil or when you're um, faced with many challenges that you turn to spirituality, which is which wasn't the case for me. I was young and I had, you know, the world was my oyster in a sense. So that was not the case for me. Um, but it is for, for, for other people. Uh, they come to it as a, uh, as a result of a challenge or something. Um, and they're clearly yeah. seeking something, aren't they? So yours That's was the learn in that um, it was sounding like, well, you know, you're very much meaning, you're seeking meaning uh, rather than solace. Yes. Yeah? Oh, definitely. That's a nice way of, of putting it, actually. I was definitely seeking meaning. I was uh, seeking a purpose and I was seeking to make a contribution to the yeah. world. One thing that I had learned when I was 19, when I was doing the Raj Yoga meditation course was this, that our world is actually really um, very quickly going in a sense downhill and there's a lot of suffering in our world and it's going to increase. And it's that time that we are going to need enough strength for ourselves but that we have to have enough strength to support other people. That's something that really stayed with me, resonated with me at the age of 19, even though I'd made the choice that at that time that I didn't want to go on a spiritual journey. Um, but that stayed with me. And it's it's it that that brought me back to it two years later. And when I had mm. that feeling of joy, actually what did happen was that because I was interested in making a difference in the world, I remember writing off to the different charities in, in the UK saying, you know, I'd like to help. I'd like to go to India or I'd like to go to Africa to help people in need. Um, and I remember receiving re responses from all those charities they basically said, well, we'll let you know when that happens. But in the meantime, here's a donation form that you can fill in to support our work. And so I did do that, actually, um, uh, because that was my immediate response. But when I had this experience of joy, what made sense to me was that you can only give to other people what you have. If wow. you don't have that inner strength, joy or love or peace, or you can't give it to other people. And so in that experience of joy, I felt that that's what I wanted and that's what the world needs mm -hmm. to have. And um, that's why it became a spiritual journey. It wasn't just a uh, social service. I mean, I say just. I don't mean in a in a derogatory way at all when I say just spiritual service. What I mean is that it felt like more uh, this deeper inner contribution um, had to be available, and those resources have to be available inside your own self. And even today, you know, after forty years, I, in the last twenty eight years, I was living in a retreat center. I have been living in a retreat center, and it's been a place of um, so many people coming, um, being available, and being, uh, you know, managing the household of a large retreat center that could potentially accommodate a hundred people, which is what mm -hmm. we had every weekend. And we were all busy 
doing. We were busy looking after the place. And, you know, I had the good fortune of not only just having the opportunities, but interest and capability, if you like, to make some contribution um, spiritually for people. Um, but a lot were very much caught up in the household of running a retreat center. And I now really believe that, that whilst the, the physical activity can really become a distraction, even if you're doing it in the name of a spiritual contribution, because we are so addicted to doing, we're so addicted to action, and that the bigger contribution that, that requires deep inner uh, strength, if you like, is to be available to people, is to be able to meet people where they're at, is to be able to give time and give of yourself to people to have conversation with them, to spend time with them, to give spiritual company, to work with them even. Um, and it's very easy to escape that in being Just caught, being caught in up in the doing. Yeah. Being easy to escape that in terms of being caught up in the doing. Is that is that what you're suggesting here? That's what you're saying. Right. That's what mm. saying. You must have had a platform that you um, could spring from to move you from that doing into the being. Um, and I, I think that's the that's the accumulation of spiritual power, isn't it, over time, where um, where you're building up that inner self. And I really wanted to explore that with you for a moment and come back to this being, um, this doing versus being aspect, which is something that I think we definitely need to be looking at. Yes. And I know our viewers want to engage with that as well. But just this aspect of, you know, your metamorphosis, how um, so much, you know, we, we come on to this spiritual journey and sometimes it's consciously chosen. Sometimes it's been, you know, you've been catapulted there by life circumstances or whatever. Sometimes it's been, you know, assigned to us and, you know, you're, you're on it. Um, but at, there's some point where an individual makes that conscious choice that and decision that I'm going to engage with it um, and that level of engagement and I, I, the way you described it I thought you were really talking quite beautifully about maybe the difference between being on a path of self-development and being on a spiritual journey um, because certainly on a spiritual journey we develop ourselves a lot um, and and need to actually to be able to stay on it um, what's that difference between, say, a path of self-development and being on a spiritual journey? Is there much of a difference in that? Is That's a really good question. I think that um, I personally feel both go together. If I really want to uh, um, uh, be real about my spiritual journey, I also have to do personal development. For my own self, my feeling is that I was... Uh, completely, um, I was very absolute in my spiritual journey for a very long time. And so much, so many years down the road, I feel that I have also now embarked on a, on a personal development exploration. But what I think is very powerful is that with that personal development, the foundation, the backbone, if you like, is the spiritual practice, which actually helps your uh, spiritual development in a very powerful way, in a subtle way, because you are not just working um, from your intellect and from knowledge and information and skills and, and capabilities, but you're actually working with a very subtle, deep energy that is latent intrinsically inside of you and that you are that spiritual energy. And so I feel that um, I, it's, a, it, it, it's double uh, enforcement when you have personal development as well as the spiritual energy of the awareness of the self as intrinsically being, um, being good, being, being peace, being love, being joy, in part of that spiritual development is to get to that. But my back, my, my bedrock, if you like, is the understanding 
I am already that. I'm mm -hmm. already peace. I'm already love. And so my personal development journey becomes that which allows me to unravel that for myself, unpack it for myself from within my own self, instead of trying to just focus on talents and skills and information and, and wisdom and, and, and other people, if you like. Mm. 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 Yeah, that's a, that's a good distinction, actually. I think that, um, that it's, it is, it is uh, the combination of both is, is critical, really. Um, that deeper inner focus and accessing that intrinsic aspect of ourselves. I wondered what to, you know, um, you've been on a journey that has had different disciplines and principles associated with it. What in particular do you think has been the mainstay of your spiritual journey like? And that's enabled you to really um, connect and bring forward those innate qualities in you. Um, you know, for, for everything, I think practice is very important. And I have to say, I'm lucky that I like discipline. I like, I like discipline right. and I like routine. Um, because once I'm in the rhythm of, of doing something, I'm off. And so I much prefer that. So what's been, what helped me is my ability to have create discipline for myself and follow the disciplines. And whether that's you know, practicing meditation every single day, whether it's waking up at a specific time every single day um, and sticking to that time in the day, in the evening. Um, uh, this is whether it's following a, a, a diet or vegetarianism, all of these things, I feel uh, lucky that I've, it, it has been like second nature for me instantly. And, um, you know, what I find is that I've been teaching meditation for, you know, for, for a very long time now. Um, what I find is that people come to, to learn on a regular basis and they still end up asking the question each time they come, but how, how, how? Mm -hmm. And um, what I've realized is that um, it's only because people find it hard to stick to a practice because um, sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not successful. When we're not successful, we want to stop doing it. And so we become slack um, and it's very easy to say, oh, I can't be bothered or I don't want to do it today. But even when you're not feeling that you're being successful at what you're doing, can you still do it? Can you still make the effort to try it the next day and the next day after that and the next day after that? I feel that this is a very important thing because, and, and here's an expression that you've probably, the viewers have already heard, am I a human being or a human doing? And we are, we have become the human doing instead of the human being. And so we have to start somewhere to start to be. And, and that means every day taking time to just be even if my mind is you know going 100 miles an hour or having trillions of thoughts um every minute i just have to say okay i'm going to take a deep breath and i'm going to have a long exhale i'm just going to be present just simply be an observer and what i begin with 5 minutes and i let it become 6 and i let it become 7 i let it become 10 and just keep at it. And this is where I think people fail. People kind of give up because it's so easy to be the human doing. And yet we are the human being. It's lovely. Look, I think that's the perfect place to push pause and invite you to lead us into a meditation on being, on, okay. on the human being. Nice, lovely. So let's just sit comfortably and relaxed and I know that everybody's probably watching this at home and so if you are watching or listening whilst doing something else give yourself the time to just sit down just turn off the gas cooker if you've got it on if the pot is brewing 
switch off the cooker, switch off the iron, whatever it is that you're doing. And just sit comfortably and relaxed. And just check in with your intention. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? I spend so many hours a day doing, acting, and interacting. But here I am now. taking a deep breath and becoming aware of your breath traveling from your nostrils down your throat, filling your lungs and your belly. And a long exhale. Let your mind just observe this practice that is so natural to us. But when you observe it, and your mind will only focus on that, And just be present here, in this moment, in this place. Perhaps become aware of this conscious thought that you have. The thought of being here. And each thought is an energy, a vibration. as you sense your breath in your body, as the oxygen gives life to your body. Feel that oxygen penetrate through the whole of your being, every cell of your body. and become conscious of that energy of peace that you've generated simply by being present and that energy of peace. Also affecting every cell of your body. And you become aware of this conscient thinking energy that you are. Separate from this physical body. But as that energy of peace becomes present in your mind and in your heart. You're no longer distracted by the body, but you are present with yourself, in yourself, by yourself. Go back to observing your breath. And feel that breath. And feel the pulsating nature of the spirit in sync with your breath. And this pulsating nature of the self allows me to see who I truly am, is thinking, 
living spiritual energy. Soft, subtle presence. Thank you. Manda, thank you. It was, um, it was a very beautiful journey inwards, wasn't it? A gentle one that acknowledges my body and, and um, allowing me to work with my body and turn within and really connect with the energy within myself. Thank you for that. It's lovely. Um, Minda, just looking at this whole aspect of connecting with myself, we get quite a few comments, and I think it's true for many of us, um, around this whole aspect of how we think and feel about ourselves. And I wondered how that's changed for you over the course of your spiritual journey, the time that you, you know, first engaged with the meditation practice and to the point you are here now. And often it's framed in terms of um, you know, comments around overthinking, comments around um, negative self thoughts or thoughts that uh, about myself that um, aren't as beautiful or as positive as they could be. So, you know, the sense of self respect and self esteem interplaying here. So, this whole aspect of how I think and feel about myself, I wondered if you could share with us how it is that you've changed or what have been the markers that enabled you to change. Um, from where you were at 21 or 19 even to where you are now? It's very interesting. For me, I think it's been the other way around in the sense that um, from a very young age, I was very confident and uh, assertive, if you like, and a strong personality. And I, I've been a doer all my life. I can turn my hand to anything. And so people always perceived me as someone confident and someone who had a lot of self-respect and so on. But I have to admit that, and, and that's what allowed me to kind of um, get so quickly at the heart of the spiritual organization, if you like, because here I was ready to do whatever it was that was needed doing. And I found that I became too caught up in the doing. Whilst I was good at what I did, I was successful at what I did in terms of um, managing projects and mon uh, mon managing events and so on. It was years later that I realized that actually in the process of the doing and being confident at doing, being confident with people, I have neglected my own deep internal spiritual self, if you like, even though I had my practice of meditation. And so I began to uh, realize that actually my doing, my sense of perfectionism, my sense of um, strength was my lack of self, my lack of self, uh, spiritual self confidence, if you like. And, um, and that I needed to change the course of my life in the sense going from such a busy, engaged, spiritual person who was good at teaching as well as, you know, doing the physical activity. I really had to step aside from that doing. And in that process, I've begun to realize how much there is been inside of me that this doing was just a protective mechanism. It was mm. just a shield that I was holding to not see my real, uh, my real self of, of my real pain or my sorrow or my, my uh, it was a, it was what I was doing to defend myself from, the external situations and relationships and so on. So it's been the other way around for me. And that's why when I said at the beginning that spirituality has been, it has to be the background, uh, the bedrock of, 
a personal development too. So while I've been realizing that actually it's just been to a great extent, I've been escaping from my own self, that I've really begun to embark on a journey in more recent times about seeing my true self, my spiritual self, but also seeing my qualities instead of um, always putting myself down from, from place of not acknowledging the, the, the real qualities that I have inside of me, mm-hmm. but force and anger and frustration and disappointment and hurt how I've um, kept myself safe from all of those things. But now as I acknowledge that, then I realize that I actually truly have to become a human being in order to be, have an honest and authentic spiritual journey. Wow. I mean, I think that's, um, it's quite a, there's those very powerful statements, aren't they? That, um, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful that meditation comes from that word meditere, which means to heal. And um, as we express our spiritual journey in the outer world and in outer contexts, um, it's quite a gorgeous process, the way meditation unravels us and allows us to get at what is intrinsically good and intact about ourselves and what has also um, been damaged and hurt and harmed and and the mechanisms we've used to avoid or not examine fully um, are at some point in our process of, of um, our process of becoming full and complete again, which is what meditation requires from us. Um, they're opened up, they're explored, um, they're made very visible to us. And, and it's a very uh, wise and powerful move to say, yes, I am going to engage with that because ultimately I want to change it. I want to be free of it. So it becomes a very, um, I think that's when it becomes a very personal journey, isn't it? Um, yes. I have to say that it can be, you can also, meditation can just be in a, a form of escape as well, or spiritual life can be a form yes. of escape. Um, because you think that, you know, because of your discipline, you're okay, you're doing well, but you are really not truly authentically and honestly looking at your own self and that you're brushing things under the carpet. And, you know, service has become, also becomes a very important pa- a part of a spiritual journey. So when you get busy in thinking that you're doing service, well, not just thinking, you might actually be doing it. But if it's still just cashing in on the on the tendency of being the doer, then you're never going to give yourself the opportunity to really see yourself and and heal, if you like. Um, only when you really acknowledge the pain and the source of your pain that you can heal the pain, heal the wounds of that pain. Mm. I guess it's like um, walking your talk in a spiritual framework, isn't it? <laughs> we talk about that in, in the world, you know, walk your talk. Well, in the inner terrain, it's also about um, um, authentically believing and feeling and thinking. So do you think there's a point where, um, how does it manifest where we are um, being and doing? Is it Are they completely incongruent or is it possible? What do you think about that of... Um, staying very authentically with who I am and coming into a world of action. Uh, I, I absolutely think that it's possible. And in fact, I know that it's possible. And I myself have had uh, glimpses of that for my own self. But I've actually met people who've um, done it. And here at the Brahma Kumari, some of the senior yogis, who most of whom are not around anymore, um, what was most inspiring about them was that they were doing both of those things, that they, they were love in action, they were peace in action, they were um, truth and um, in action, that they're, um, they were both of the, it's not like, it's not that you're phased out in your consciousness somewhere else doing something else, but when spirituality is being lived, it's manifesting through the quality of, the quality or the, yeah, the qualities that you demonstrate 
in your action, in your interaction with other people, whether it's the quality of love or patience or tolerance or, or a being able to accommodate what's happening around you, to be able to just be peaceful, to be able to separate yourself from what's happening, to be able to know when to engage, when to um, uh, pull back. All of these are aspects of spirituality being lived. And you can only do that when you've, you've kind of uh, really held your own awareness and your own consciousness in the space that's beyond the confines of the physical, beyond the confines of the limits of time and space that you are able to experience another reality other than the reality that you live in physically. And so when you are uh, spiritually, in, when you're doing both the things, the doing and the being, then you're bringing that reality that is beyond the confines of the physical in your interaction, in your thoughts, in your vision, in your attitude, in your mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and so definitely, I think that that's our goal uh, to be that. And yes, I have had... Um, not just glimpses, I've had phases where I've lived that and then something happens, something comes up to just pull me out of that and make me ordinary and mundane and, and, and I'm having to work hard at bringing that consciousness back to the forefront of my mind. And that's the journey, ups and downs are mm -hmm. the journey. Sometimes you fail, sometimes you're successful and but each time the failure becomes the lows become not too low. And, and I believe that um, eventually there will be a, a state of equilibrium. And, um, and just on those ups and downs, I think everyone can relate to that, no matter what kind of journey you're on. Um, how have you managed to navigate the ups and downs? I think there are points, crisis points on a spiritual journey where, you know, you're really considering... And this is the beauty of the spiritual journey where you're really thinking and considering, is this, is this still um, the journey that I need to be on? Is it working for me? Um, am I working with it or against it? How am I aligning with it? And I think these sorts of reflective questions are hugely helpful. Um, ups and downs, most definitely. And often they can, on the outside, look like nothing's happening. But on the inside, there's a lot of... Um, you know, there's a lot to navigate. There's there's a, a trough that you can feel like you're in. Um, we don't worry too much about the ups, but uh, they're worth examining as well. Um, but just about navigating those ups and downs on a spiritual journey, Manda, I think you've, um, you've probably, like all of us, had some experience with that. What's been your, um, your rudder, if you like, What's been your compass to help you navigate that, those terrain, that terrain? I think it's what I said already, that mm -hmm. uh, when, when the lows, uh, downs come, uh, I know I have to understand and accept that that's part of uh, life generally. But when those downs come, what is it that I've got to learn here? That's been my biggest question that I ask myself and that um, uh, sometimes it's hard to ask the question, but sometimes I ask the question, I may not necessarily find the answer straight away, um, but it is an important question, I feel. And, but I also realize that sometimes these downs are only a question of time too. And sometimes I just have to sit with them. I've just got to sit with this feeling and as I told you right at the outset I've I've never really had the thought I wish I didn't come on this spiritual journey I've never had that thought and maybe that's my fortune or or what I I I haven't felt that but yeah lots of downs lots of ups and um and it's life it's just life and I know that each downer also is taking me up yes that's the trick isn't it yeah the, you might there might, it might be in a trough, but you're still moving forward, and I, I think that's the 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 great trick with spirituality. Or well, it's not a trick really, but the one of the lovely blessings in spirituality is um, this journey is that 
the greater level of my self-honesty, um, the greater the reward. And, it, but and the greater the level of honesty, the more painful it is as well at times. That's right. And unless we're prepared to, unless I'm prepared to, and, and others engaged on a spiritual journey are prepared to examine that, because underneath it, there is a treasure. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes it's just time uh, to, to, to uh, reveal itself fully and, and heal and that. But often there's a realisation to be had that um, can be the big breakthrough, actually, um, to moving into that zone of being rather than the zone of doing. Um, yeah. I like what you said about sometimes it's just time too. I wanted to, to check in with you about um, the role the divine has played in your journey. Um, so yes, navigating the, the down points, um, but just this whole aspect of your relationship with the divine and, and how that might have changed for you over time. Mm. That's a beautiful question. You know, as uh, before I, I came to the Brahma Kumaris and learned Raj Yoga, um, the divine didn't really play much of a role in my life um, growing up. But I think that um, it, it's been a key part of my, my stay, if you like, here. And that is that I've always, I have felt that presence in my life. But what I like with the Brahma Kumaris and the understanding of the divine is that it's um, it's um, it's the the purest, most unconditional, most available spiritual energy that I will ever come across in my life. And so, whilst in the beginning the journey, the the relationship was very much was like here I am and I'm here to take from that one. But I, as time has gone on, it's really become a relationship of a partnership that we have with each other, myself and the divine. Um, and also that we both have a commitment to each other. We both have a relationship of trust with each other. And, and, and the, the change in my relationship, if you like, is that how much I how much I trust that the divine trusts me, mm. trusts me for who I am and for uh, for what I what I have to bring to the party, to the world, to the relationship with the divine. So as time has gone on, that relationship has become much more subtle, much more personal, much more natural, if you like, and easy. And it was only yesterday that we were having a conversation in our class that we have regularly, that it's an energy that, that is present for me all the time, if you like. It's like, I never feel, I don't really feel without it, but I just have to make sure that I turn my mind towards it, that everything I do, it's filled with the energy of my love for the divine, and the divine's love for me. And so whether I live in a, in a fully spiritual environment or whether I'm on my own by myself, I don't feel any different inside. Mm -hmm. I feel just the same, just as connected, just as close as I would be. Let's say if I was living in a, in a BK Raj Yoga Center, as when I'm not living in a center, when I'm by myself in my own space, I feel exactly the same inside. And so that relationship is deeply important to me. It's a very, very gentle presence that I feel is just a thought away. Mm. I can imagine, um, Amanda, that. Uh, given what you've just said, a lot of viewers would be thinking, wow, I'd really like a relationship with the divine like that, you know, to be able to engage and feel that presence and that one's grace and, and guidance and this whole aspect of, of the divine, the relationship being that of a partnership, a companion. Now that's hugely different from, you know, the things that we've been exposed to over the centuries around what the divine God, Allah, so many different names, 
um, to that one has uh, been spoken of in that way that you know it's a relationship of fear it's a relationship of you might not ever get to know that one um, so many different uh, kind of understandings there and here you are speaking of a relationship of connection a relationship of presence a relationship of um, deep respect and companionship um, so just a question here I imagine people are probably wondering how did that relationship happen how, how did you develop it um, so see how it's changed over time but how did that manifest what did you do or did you do nothing what happened uh, no I think it was regular practice of meditation mm -hmm. For, for us here at the Brahma Kumaris, the understanding of the divine as a spiritual energy. It's not a physical energy. It's not, it's not a physical being that we're engaged in rituals or worship or anything like that. It's really the awareness that I, the spiritual being, the soul, the spirit, um, is, is exactly the same as the supreme being. We're saying the divine, but the supreme being, the supreme soul, the supreme spirit, and and I think that it's that that the that my my engagement with the divine has not been a, a vertical one that I'm down here and that one is up there and I try to um, to go from here to up there and it's the divine being and that I'm I'm someone so low and I try to build a relationship in that way but what I learned here which was so powerful is that I am in a sense the offspring of the divine so my relationship is a horizontal one that um, if I am the offspring then I'm in perfect image of that one so the more I develop my my own awareness of myself as a spiritual being as a spiritual energy whose intrinsic nature is that of peace, of love, of purity and beauty. And that that one is exactly the same, no different. And that I am engaging with that one. I've forgotten that I am that. I became conscious of this physical body and so I made myself limited. The difference between I and that spiritual being, the divine, is that the divine never loses the awareness that that one is the divine. Call, call it he, she, whatever it is that works for you, because it's genderless, just as the soul is genderless, the divine is genderless. And, but yet both the masculine and the feminine um, um, principles are present in that one, just as much they're present in I, the spiritual being. And so engaging with that clarity of understanding, I feel is important. And so I, first of all, it's not that I'm remembering the divine or connecting with the divine, give me something, let me be like you. It's not that, it's more, I'm a soul, I'm a peaceful being, and as that peaceful being, I actually open myself to that unconditional, eternal presence of peace and love that's always available to me anytime, any place, anywhere, free from all judgments about myself, but always available like a parent is available to their child in the same way that one is available to me. And so practicing that, engaging in that, engaging in conversation, dialogue, and in solitude and, and in, in introversion, that relationship becomes a reality. I think on that point, Manda, it would be lovely to invite you and to, to um, do another meditation with us on engaging with the divine, connecting with the divine. Let's do that. So again, sit comfortably and relaxed. And just allow yourself to become so still, quiet, rested, and in comfort with your own self. 
physically, psychologically, emotionally, and mentally. And with this space of comfort and ease, Also be aware of your breath. As you become quiet and silent, your breath becomes affected by that energy. And your breath too becomes slow and soft. So let's make sure that we don't just make this an intellectual, a heady practice, but engage with it, with the whole of your being, your mind and your body. Your mind and your heart. Becoming aware that whilst present in this physical body, you are a spiritual energy, thinking, conscient, living being. And as you become aware, and perhaps intensify that awareness, that the energy of the spirit is the energy of deep love and presence. And with so much desire in the purest way to open myself to another energy, the energy of the divine, the supreme, the presence of unconditional love. And in this presence, I feel that that same emer love emerges because I'm touched by this notion that there is a being out there that loves me just because I exist, just because I'm a living, thinking, conscient, energy, imperfect image of that being, beyond confines of matter and space and time. We have an eternal connection. I've longed for this eternal connection. I always felt that it was possible. But now I realize that it's possible only beyond confines of space, time and matter. So I enter into this domain of spiritual light where we can both meet. I find myself surrounded by light now and here. And it is in this light, the light of deep peace. That I feel another presence. presence of the divine too.
as if we know each other, as if we recognize the same eternal energy of peace. of love, and there's a sense of a presence of truth in this eternal connection. It never changes. I simply forget it. But I remind myself of this connection. I have a right to it. And it's available to me anytime, any place. I feel myself enveloped by this presence of love. Thank you. We have an expression, Om Shanti. I am the essence of peace. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for sharing, you know, your journey and your connection with the divine in that meditation. I think it opens up much possibility for all of us. Um, I think I'd like to move into this other aspect of the spiritual journey with you, and that is about relationship with others. So, yes, that relationship with myself and, and then that connection with the presence and the deep intimate relationship that's possible with the Supreme Soul or the Divine. And, uh, and just looking at this whole aspect of moving into the outer world and notwithstanding your comment around, you know, moving to being a human being from a human doing, but looking at that connection and you've alluded to um, witnessing and being um, in relationship with people who, the very senior yoginis who have, um, who do have been the, the incredible embodiment of that and and how magnificent it is to be in their company to see that. But this whole area of you know, coming into relationship with one another and the impact that meditation has on that. Um, wanting to just, if you could share a few of your thoughts and your experiences on um, the impact that meditation has had on you and therefore have you seen any change in your relationships with other people other people indeed are you even relating to them as people um, what's how's that been for you um, I have to say perhaps the biggest lesson that I've had to learn are, are lessons in terms of my relationships with people um, on the one hand I'm generally a, a person who's very light and easygoing but then I can also be uh, someone who um, I don't, uh, I don't uh, dis discriminate in my relationships with people. And sometimes I think that you do have to have boundaries in relationships with people. So my, my biggest learning in my spiritual journey has been about where to engage and where not to engage and how much to reveal and how much to conceal. And all of those things have been my, my biggest learnings, I think. Um, but I think that um, uh, the, uh, the more I've, um, I've begun to understand my own self, um, the more I'm able to uh, have much more easier and more comfortable relationships that, that, that sometimes might need boundary and I'm able to apply those boundaries. And sometimes I need to just be giving and um, generous and open 
um, that's also um, uh, that's also developed for me. Um, and so I think that um, the biggest learning is through relationships. We learn about ourselves um, from the way in which we relate to other people that we should relate in a certain way and we end up not relating to them in that way. So we're able to see our own weaknesses. I'm able to see my own weaknesses in that regard. Um, I have to say it's still work in progress for me very much um, in terms of my relationship with people. But I think that what has helped me a lot is what I've learned through meditation practice, but particularly my relationship with the divine is the generosity of spirit in my relationships with people. Mm -hmm. To see people for what they are and to accept them for what they are. Mm -hmm. It's a big learning and not wanting people to be something other than what they are or something that I would like them to be. And it's these are the things that, that cause us a lot of pain and sorrow and suffering. Mm -hmm. And um, when there's that really deep self-acceptance, it it's, seems to me uh, and be my experience that it's easier to accept others. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, the journey is really about one's own self at the end of the day. It's really mm. about one's own self only. Mm. And the way the relationship with the divine brings out the magnificence of each one of us to allow us to come in easier and accepting connection with each other and joyful connection. Mm. Yeah, I like that, that the connection with the divine does bring out the magnificence in us. And that's why I say generosity is what, if there was one quality that I would say, I feel generosity in the sense that accepting, allowing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, and here we are now and, and, you know, just about 2022, we're closing out 2021. And We've seen a world in incredible challenge, um, and that means people in incredible challenges. We've seen an environment that's more challenged than ever, and you just need to listen to one minute of the news, and you'll hear all about social injustice. Um, so a very changed world from, you know, the one that you were in 40 years ago, embarking on a spiritual journey, and... Um, and here we are now with a very changed world. How do you apply your consciousness, to, your spiritual consciousness to, to these sorts of challenges in our world, the environmental challenges, the social just, injustice, um, and still enable that vision or that interaction with others from a space of acceptance? Um, I feel that what the world needs now in all of these situations, it's not my job to, to, to judge or to uh, ensure that my job is to ensure that I don't become biased and prejudiced towards one or the other way of being. But I feel that what the world needs now is our compassion, my compassion. The world needs now my, my understanding, my my love, if you like. And that's, you know, if I buy into all of that that's happening around me, then I'm going to start being affected by it. I've got to, I've, I see it, but I see it separate for myself. And to maintain my own internal space of dignity, my own internal space of um, generosity of spirit that I mentioned, not just on a one-to-one -one relationship, but in the bigger scheme of things, and bring some power and bring some light into the world um, so that the world receives my spiritual support. I think it's the only thing that I can do right now. And this requires so much power, so much strength to be still and to be strong and to be held um, in your own dignity, but also in the presence of the divine, mm -hmm. so that you're able to uh, give the most powerful energy, or generate the most powerful energy of love and light that the world needs right now. So working through the power of vibration. 
working through the power of vibration, but also, I mean, yeah, that's one thing, but the other aspect, engaging with it in the most positive way you can. For instance, right now, COP26 is happening in Glasgow. There's a huge contingency um, that um, that's present there of 26, 30 people who are bringing the awareness of consciousness. And, and also, actually, you know, when you talk about the environment, I am trying to um, live hol holistically, trying to uh, help in the environment by, by what I eat and how I eat and how much I eat and how I dress and how I kind of use my resources, how I keep my life simple. All of these things are practical things that we are also, um, uh, we also need to pay attention to, um, as well as the contribution that we make um, through our consciousness. And so I think it's it's both of those aspects that are important. Mm. Sure, it's a good combination. It's a powerful combination, isn't it? Powerful of power of uh, positive vibration, but also um, manifesting physically what it is that I can do yeah. to bring that change. So, Manda, a question about a better world. What's your vision of a better world? My vision of a better world is that. First and foremost, there'll be absolute harmony within my own self, harmony with my, with my environment, um, and therefore harmony with each other. A life in which where consciousness and matter have this interplay that is, um, that is subtle and also um, very peaceful and divine. And I feel that as our consciousness evolves into a higher spiritual state, then we will bring that to the world of matter as well. And our world um, can become a place of um, beauty and truth. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Amanda, it's uh, time for us to close, but I, before we do that, I wanted to ask you, a question around what's your next on your spiritual journey? You've alluded to it, but let's put some special focus on it. What do you see as being your next? It's a really good question. And, and I, I have to say I'm a little bit, um, I'm a bit reluctant and perhaps um, this is a chance to let go of my reluctance. My, um, my deepest desire is to demystify spirituality. Mm -hmm. in the sense to give language and meaning to deep spiritual experiences so that people can own, people can create their own experiences and own them. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say language, I mean verbal language um, to some, uh, some deep spiritual truths not too much language, not too many words, but to be able to give language to some of these deep spiritual experiences, I think a lot of people have them, but they don't know how to give language to them or how to give meaning to them. And I would like to be able to do that for people. And um, so how that happens, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Am I asking for some platform? I don't mean anything like that. And that's why I'm always reluctant to say something that it, it, that it doesn't appear to be arrogant. I don't want to be arrogant about, about it, but it's uh, whatever that platform is, I don't know what that platform might look like, mm. but I would like to First of all, do that deep inner exploration myself to be able to give language. Because mm. I, I feel I express when I'm in conversation better. Mm. Wow, that's, um, that's actually very authentic and, and equally very spiritually magnificent, Manda. And I, I've got a very deep sense that that's going to come to pass in, um, in a very short space of time. Uh, and I, I have that sense just from the way that you've been sharing on Universe tonight. Um, and, and deeply thank you for, for the insights, the honesty, the authenticity that you've 
that you've shared as you've, um, you know, in a short space of time, navigated 40 years of experiences and, and distilled it into, into this conversation this evening, some of those very key moments. So blessings to you, Manda, from us all here down under in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we wish you well. We do hope to see you in this part of the world when the um, international borders open. It would be lovely yep. to have you join us it's on these shores. On but, my um, agenda. Definitely on my channel. <laughs> and, um, and I look forward to that very, very much. But from our hearts, thank you so much, Manda. It's been an absolute yeah. treat to have you with us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you for the invitation. And yes, definitely look forward to seeing you soon. A big, big thanks to Manda for sharing her spiritual journey with us. Um, that was Manda Patel and, and um, speaking on spiritual journey and taking up some very key points in that, uh, things I think that would have resonated with many of you as they did with me. Um, viewers, if you'd, uh, coming towards the end of the program now, just um, wanting to let you know what's happening and what's going to be happening over the next short while. Um, we have, as always, a takeaway slide that enables you to, if you'd like to browse our online bookshop, Eternity Inc., which has a full range of books on self-empowerment and spirituality always at not-for-profit prices and um, great gifts there for Christmas and the new year too. Even as we close 2021, if you'd like to subscribe to Open Your Eyes to the Universe, then please do so. It'll enable you to receive monthly updates and you can email us at special.events at au.brahmakumarisoreandword.org. And uh, as I've said, this is our last episode of Open Your Eyes to the Universe for 2021. We started out with Bishop Philip Huggins and Charlie Hogg on invocations for 2021, reflecting on inner movement in the context of pandemic restricted outer movement, reflecting on inner stillness amidst huge outer turbulence and reflecting on inner activism and its relationship to the form and quality outer activism may take. And then in February, psychiatrist Dr. Sarah Egger joined us on Universe to explore self-compassion, which she defined as the very opposite of self-criticism. It's an inner strength that enables us to acknowledge our shortcomings, learn from them, and make the necessary changes with an attitude of kindness and respect. And Sarah explored the links between our body, our mind and soul, and how by using our deepest innate spiritual qualities, we can meet our own pain and suffering with patience, kindness, and care. And then as we moved into March, Antonella Ferrare from Italy took up the topic, the language of love, and outlined six qualities that allow us to communicate from the heart. And then in April, Simon, Simon Urs from Germany and Marie Lesek Dirks from uh, Netherlands joined Universe uh, with Carolyn Ward, and they were exploring a life beyond belief where they were really sharing their personal experiences of navigating the many transitions on a spiritual journey towards spiritual maturity. In May, we were with, in conversation with Dr. Raksha al a palliative care physician based in South Africa. And she was discussing a new and fresh approach to managing stress, that being love versus force. Mathematician Dr. Grace Lopez-Charles, based in Guyana, joined us on Universe in June to check in with us on deciphering truth, examining who deceives us and how easily are we deceived. These are pertinent questions to ask ourselves as we navigate the unseen in our everyday living. Then in July, Universe took up a conversation with two very experienced mediators and equally experienced meditators. They were Melbourne-based Chrissy Mahoney and Niall Phoenix discussing conflict solutions. In August, we were with writer Barbara Bossett Ramsey unpacking the cycle of time in a story written by Barbara called Turnings, the Story of Time. And then moving into September, Universe welcomed performing artist Carmen Warrington in conversation on being calm and creative. Carmen is known as the voice of peace to thousands of people around the world for her guided meditation commentaries and sound baths. And then in October, just last month, we were exploring guardianship of our environment with Sonia, with Valerian, and also with Carolyn. And then, of course, this evening, engaging on the topic of spiritual journey with Manda Patel. 
Within the comfort of your home, we've traveled across many continents of our world, talking with meditators who engage with life in many different ways. So it's um, a very heartfelt special thanks and blessings to all these authentic, inspiring people who've been sharing their insights, their experiences with us on Open Your Eyes to the Universe throughout 2021. If you'd like to recap on any of the episodes, we'll place the links in the chat box for you, and I'm sure Jane's been doing that as I've been mentioning them. And of course, to our viewers, our thanks for your questions and to your participation. Over the course of 2021, we've been considering three key questions. What are the spiritual resources we need in these times? What kind of consciousness could I contribute during this year, 2021? And what is time calling us to do on an individual level and also as global citizens? I hope that, um, that these explorations have been hugely beneficial to you and have positively impacted you, those you live with, those you share your life with, and how you engage with our planet. So here we are, closing out, and from the Universe team, Jan Wright, Peter Clark, and Debbie Hannon, we're very much looking forward to sharing 2022 with you. We'll be back on Saturday, the 22nd of January, 2022, at 6 p.m. That's um, Australian AEDT, Daylight Saving Time. Until then, we'd like to wish you a very relaxing and peaceful Christmas, and may the new year be filled with love, with happiness, in an abundance of spiritual treasures. So until we see you again in January, take care, walk lightly on this earth, be kind, be peaceful, and Om Shanti.